And we are thrilled to kick off our October PD series with Adam Bellow, who is a hugely knowledgeable influencer in the EdTech space. Uh, if you don't already know, Adam is the founder and CEO of EduClipper, which is a really great tool that allows teachers and students to curate and share digital content both inside and outside of the classroom, as well as his new iOS app called We Learned It. Um, Adam is an educational technologist, a former English teacher, and personally one of my favorite people to follow on Twitter. And if you guys have not connected with him yet on Twitter, you can find him under the handle Adam Bellow, so relatively easy to remember. Um, and without uh, further ado, Adam, I'll pass it off to you. I will be on the line if you need anything. Awesome. Thanks so much. Um, can you guys hear me in the chat? I guess just a quick one yes would be awesome. <laughs> Yeah, there you go, and there's the yes, so we'll get started. Uh, thank you so much for the kind introduction, and I'm really excited to be here with you guys. Um, so, you know, I'm not going to talk too much about the companies that, that I'm involved with personally. I just want to say a quick note about EasyBiv. It's one of, the, one of the earlier ed tech companies that I kind of got to know, both being local from New York and also just something I found extremely useful for teachers and students. So I have a, a great deal of respect for both the product and the people behind it. So. Um, you know, so much so that we actually even, even worked in uh, the EasyBib API into EduClipper, and I can talk about that later uh, very briefly. But I, I want to get started and kind of go back. <laughs> if you're a nerd or, uh, you know, into technology, this might be familiar. This was my first experience with technology. And uh, I will admit that, that I am a nerd, and I, I think nerd is the new cool. Hopefully I'm right. Um, <laughs> a proud nerd. And, uh, you know, we've come a long way. Whenever I talk about technology, especially talking about web tools and apps and things like that, I always like to caveat the conversation by saying, do you remember when? You know, do you remember when these were the only titles that were considered educational technology titles? And you, know, you, were, you, were <laughs> you were dropped off in a computer lab, or perhaps you yourself had used these titles, and, and this was it. And it was so limiting, right? We had the, the where in the world was Carmen San Diego is the way to learn uh, social studies, right? And the web was a different place back then. We had this idea of going online to just get information. You know, I'm not going to talk about Web 1.0 you know, versus Web 2.0 because basically everything is a Web 2.0 tool right now. What I like to remind um, you know, my students <laughs> and my children when they get impatient that this was how we all connected to the Internet, you know, through the phone, and we waited five minutes to get on. And you know, it, There's actually a scary fact over here that says, at one point in 1999, I believe, 50% of all CDs in the entire world had an AOL logo on them. So my oh my, how things have changed. And now we're just inundated, right? You have experiences like these webinars. You have TED Talks and YouTube videos and Facebook and tweets. You know, the tweets, I can't even count how many tweets <laughs> with new tools and new things to share and people's blogs. And it's just an amazing, amazing uh, time to kind of be saturated by this information. But sometimes it's hard to keep up, and a lot of teachers, um, a lot of teachers are really having to, the struggle with like wanting to do the best and the, and the most amazing, exciting tools. But at the same point, you know they're changing every day, and there's so many of them. So I'd like to talk about a couple of things I think might be really helpful to put into the web toolbox. And um, I caveat it by saying web tool instead of web 2.0 tool, because um, you know when you talk about airplanes, we don't call this an airplane 2.0, and you know we don't call this computer a computer 2.0. We just kind of have evolved, and our terminology as a .0 reminds me of these old days. So we like to talk about things as, as web tools. And I'll give one piece of advice before I jump into the tools in a moment. Is very simply, we want to take these things and try one new thing, and really try to stick to one new thing at a time. Hopefully, you'll learn five, six new tools here. I'm going to present a whole bunch of them, but you know, the ones that are new that stick out to you that you're like, oh, I want to try that. Don't try to do all of them the same day. Try to give each of them, you know, a little bit of time, see if it works, see if it works for the kids or for the purpose. And if not, you retool it, you tweak it, and you come back to it, and, uh, you know, you get better incorporated into your classroom. Because tools are really nothing more than, than ways to enhance what you're already doing in your classroom, ways for you to be a more effective teacher or for the students to create and share more effectively. Um, so with that little speech or diatribe out of the way, we'll get started and look at some of these great tools that I think are worth giving it a shot. Um, you know, it's funny because I've presented on tools for a long time, so I will tell you that 
some of these tools are not brand new. And if you've heard of them, that's totally fine. What I found recently is that a lot of the tools that I would you know, consider classics or staples, really, um, are not necessarily talked about, even though they're extremely, extremely useful. Even something like EasyBib, for example, you know, you guys must feel at, at, at the company level, people must feel like, oh, we've been around for so long that sometimes it's not included in like the most exciting apps. But you know what? It's one of those really, really awesome apps that people need to know about. So um, with, with that, I'll let you guys take notes. The only thing we have to do is uh, – I, I see we're old fogies now, I know. Uh, so the easiest way to do this was to use uh, the site that I run, Edge Clipper. And again, I'm not going to talk about that site too much, but um, the easiest way to, to collect all these tools and show you them was to create a clipboard. And what I did was I just put them into one clipboard, um, bit.ly slash web tools 2014, and the W and the T do have to be capitalized. And I'll tweet that out and put it in the link in, in a little bit as well. But that's a, a clipboard with 35 or so clips that will give you all the things we're talking about today, including other things that I've been talking about in other presentations that we won't get time to. I do talk fast, but I don't talk that fast. So let's get started. So one of the ones I just want to start with as a fun one, and this kind of just, just to juxtapose the idea of how limiting the web experience was years ago, is something that's called Build with Chrome. Uh, I have little kids. They love Legos. I step on Legos almost every day in my house. And you know, Build with Chrome is a really, really cool app that allows you to kind of take Google Maps, uh, Google Earth rather, and build a Lego experience on top of that. And I'll try to demo it real fast. Um, I have a screen up over here where I'm looking at the webinar live. So I will tell you that if things don't look amazing, um, I could tell already it's a little laggy. I don't want to kind of get you lost, but I will try to show you a little bit of the live demo. So I'm going to jump in here to uh, build with Chrome and just show you the interface over here. Again, Keep in mind that this is not a program to download. Everything is web-based. And what it's going to allow me to do is build a, a piece of, uh, of whatever I want to be, a building or a structure of some sort. And the nice thing is, is you can change the colors. You can change the different types of pieces. You can build any type of thing you want. This is obviously great for things like an engineering class or a physics class, but it's also a lot of fun to take this and, and tie it into Google Maps. So you can actually publish this map onto, uh, as I mentioned, onto Google Earth. So you could take it and make it seen in 2D or in 3D and um, build it on top of an actual, uh, an actual piece of the world, so to speak. And you know, I'm just rotating around to show you kind of an example over here. Lots of fun. It works with your Google account. So if you have a Google account for schools, you could just log in and start working on it. There are tutorials on how to do this. A lot of fun, but also you know, if you're talking about Math, for example, you could have a kid build a model of their bedroom or of one of the rooms in, in their school and then measure, well, if each brick is, you know, if each, every two uh, circles on the bricks equals a foot, how many feet would the room be, etc. You can make this really, you know, as much fun as it is to play with, you could kind of wrap it around a lesson. And uh, again, I just happen to like the way that that, uh, that functions. So I'm going to kind of fly a little bit instead of going through the deck, which I will be happy to share some of those slides with you guys, uh, and, and EasyBib will send that out in a little bit. Um, do you need Chrome to have this? Uh, I saw that question come up. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Um, that is the one thing. It's, it's called Build with Chrome, and that, the reason is, is it's trying to show off the capabilities of Chrome. So that is the one caveat there. And I'll try to mention caveats as I go through, Susan. That was a very good point. So yeah, you would need Chrome to get that working. Um, one that I'm going to start with is, is kind of a creative one. If you have heard of Canva, some people have. It's kind of still new. It's in beta. Um, I want to click on Canva. It's a great way to do WYSIWYG design. So WYSIWYG is what you see is what you get. And Canva is a really beautiful, simple way to build things. So I'm going to start with this uh, beautiful picture right here. And it says, Tidal Rise Boat Cruises, Living the Dream. I'm sure that they are. And I'm going to start tapping onto the actual um, item over here. So I can obviously change the font, so I can say Easy Bib, and uh, let's say you could change the color. Let's make it logo colors, and I can come in over here and I can change the background message. I can crop it out. I can do all sorts of things with it. Uh, change it to a different color. Put a filter on it, or I can come in over here and change the background altogether. There are lots of free ones, so I can click in over here and drop in drop in these free backgrounds. Or I can actually take um, 
I, I can take uh, files that I want and upload to this. So I can come over here and I have a picture of one of my kids over here that's Reed sleeping with an iPad. Um, I can take that and put it over here as the background. And notice over here I can bring it to the back. I can, can kind of reposition this however I want. Very, very simple to use. Very, very easy uh, site and, and a lot of fun for students. You can design lots of cool things in here, lots of posters. The way that they kind of make their money is, is by allowing you to kind of, you'll notice over here if I want to add elements, so there's like text elements over here. This one that says the coffee shop is free and it's gorgeous. However, there are some that are down below that you do pay for. And um, you know, they do have a lot of clip art that's free, but they also um, do charge for some of those things. So in line with that, thinking about clip art, which I know is the most unsexy ed tech topic you probably could talk about, but um, one of the really cool sites that, that a friend of mine, Steve Gembo, introduced me to is called The Noun Project. And uh, The Noun Project is it basically their mission is to get a symbol, a visual symbol for every single uh, noun in the entire human language. So if you need a, a beautiful like flat graphic, you know, uh, if you think about this, <laughs> You think about like the, uh, the new iOS 7, 8 look where, where Apple kind of made flat graphics popular for everyone again. Um, they even have things like if I type in uh, Star Wars, I, I think Star Wars has, look at this. Th these are clip art that you can use for Star Wars, and there's a good number of them. Um, this is pretty interesting. My son's going to be Darth Vader for Halloween, so I'm going to use that one for now. All you do is click on it. You click on download. I'm going to just log in. I didn't realize I wasn't logged in real fast. Um, you can download, you can uh, log in via Facebook, or you could of course do traditional email. And I click on download over here, and it's going to give me three choices. I can buy this outright as a purchase. I can use this as my premium account and, and upgrade to it. Or if I use Creative Commons and attribute this piece of content, I can download it for absolutely nothing. So I'm not going to download it right now just because I don't think I'm going to use that anywhere. <laughs> but if you're thinking about a project and kids want to come in, they're doing something with let's say, um, you know, something to do with, let's say, oceans. You know, you type in oceans, and there's going to be a couple of things here. I'm sure ocean would probably give us more, uh, more options over here. So there's lots and lots and lots of clip art. I mean, it's, it's really extensive. And uh, you know, with, a, with a simple graphics tool like Canva, you could import any of these and kind of make a poster as, as unique and as cool as you want without using it for the, uh, for the cost. So, Oh yeah, and, and it's a good note. I saw the note over there from easy business. Some of these are public domain. So there are some of these that are completely free that basically say you can do whatever you want with it. Uh, not even Creative Commons. You can kind of sell it, put it on a t-shirt, who cares? Uh, and I would say it's probably five to ten percent of these these images are are that way. So that really is, is a quick look at two of those tools, Canva and uh, you know, can be used in conjunction with a tool like the Noun Project. All you would have to do is go to uploads, upload it from your own images drag in that file, and you'd be good to go. So very, very cool. Hopefully that was new to some folks over there. And uh, it, it's a good one. Another one I want to show you is some people ask me all the time, like, how do you take out parts of images? And one of the tools that I've been using a lot recently to kind of show off with students is something called Clipping Magic. So I'm going to see if I have a picture over here. I have a picture of my son that has a background. He's wearing my Google glasses. But there's like a kind of a messy background over there. Uh, it's our house, which is always usually pretty messy. So I'm going to drop that image over here. And what this site allows me to do is where I see this green plus sign and this red uh, negative sign, I can map out what I want to keep of this image. So if I want to keep him, I'm, I'm kind of drawing over the little guy. And I'm going to do this fairly quickly, just the essence of time. And again, all web-based. So this doesn't have to be on a, on a Mac or a PC or anything like that. It obviously uh, is easier on the computer. I can then click on the net negative and remove this whole background. So you'll see on the left-hand side, or rather on the right-hand side, you'll see what is being uh, edited away from the image. So I'm just coming real fast over here. And I'm going to have a picture that I could kind of put into, let's say, a Canva or somewhere else that doesn't have that crazy background. And it didn't take very long to do that. You can get very precise over here, so I'm not going to show that. But these tools over here allow us to really come in and like, you know, map out exactly what we're going to keep, what we're not going to keep. But uh, it, a lot of fun 
force students to use that. It's very, very simple. Um, very, very simple to use. And I see I'm just checking the comments over here. Some people talking about Flickr. Flickr is a great place to get images. Uh, Creative Commons, uh, search.creativecommons.org where you can find lots of amazing images. Uh, you know, and, and teaching students about using images, you know, the same way that we talk about EasyBit being an, an amazing tool for citation, it's so important for us to be able to um, teach these students that you know, they can't just steal any image they want, that when they go onto YouTube, they shouldn't you know, use a soundtrack from, from whatever their favorite song is at the moment as their song. I mean, YouTube's getting better about blocking these things, but again, just teaching them that, that digital citizenship and just good copyright law is important. So speaking of, of old ones, uh, I'm going to share one of the ones that I just genuinely love. Um, this is one that I used when I was teaching, so that's a while ago. But uh, I still go back to this as being one of the most exciting tools that you can work with, with, with students. And it's called My Story Maker. So My Story Maker, it's part of um, the Carnegie Library of Pittsburgh. It's part of the things that they offer. And it's a Flash-based product, so this will not work on an iPad. Um, I've always wondered, you know, they, they should make one for iPad. Um, but here's my story maker. It's kind of like, you know, if you think about stuff that you may have seen recently or, or more recently, you might have seen things like um, Puppet Pals or some, some of the other, you know, slightly more recent uh, tools for, for the iPad. But what I love about this is, you know, I put in my name over here. It asks me to define who my character is. So I'm going to pick a genie, and then I have to give what's his main goal. So defeat, find, love, make friends, rescue, travel or want, I'm going to have him find. And then you can have him find a character, an item, a scenic object, or a setting. So I'm going to have him find the lamp. All right, and we go to OK. So this is where it gets really neat. I can start changing any of these pieces. So the genie who found the secret lamp. Well, maybe it wasn't a secret lamp. Maybe it was a magic lamp. Or maybe my vocabulary word um, for, the, for the week was the uh, unique lamp. Uh, and I go to OK, start my story. It gives you a little tutorial. I'm going to be the tutorial for you. I just want to show you kind of the uh, just the amazing uh, just ease of use and really cool way to get this uh, this tool going. So yes, there's this neat animation over here, and I can walk these characters along. When I click on a character, uh, I can go over to interact, and I can say can spell, fight, give, kiss, shake, throw, all these exciting things. I also give actions, so I can do something like the lion dance. And it writes the story for me on the bottom. So it's writing once upon a time the lion dance. Uh, and I can add to this, so with style. And I can add, again, I've used this with, with sixth graders who are doing vocabulary. I've used this with 12th graders where they're doing, you know, creating a scene where it's the, the sequel to whatever happened in the story or uh, the missing scene from Romeo and Juliet. Uh, then let's say over here I click on this lamp. I'm going to take the lamp and I'm going to bring it towards the lion. So now the lion is holding the lamp. Clicking on him again, I can go to interact, uh, and he can go to give. And I click on the genie, and it says the lion gave the genie, uh, gave the lamp to the genie. And then you can do all sorts of stuff. You know, maybe the UFO comes, the genie gets into the UFO, and then the UFO flies away. Uh, <laughs> whatever the story is you want to do. Um, so again, just a really, really cool tool for kids. A couple of caveats on this. So there can be, I think, 10 slides up at front or 10 pages to the story. And when you leave the story, you press end and it publishes it. And what it does by publishing it is it gives you the ability to view it, to get this magic code, which if they write down this code, if students write this down or teachers write this down, they can uh, come back to this story that they've written. Or it can be shared printed, or downloaded. And those are some new options. They've actually added these since they started the site. So again, just a really easy, um, cool story maker for younger students. Uh, as I said, I've used it with slightly older students as well, and it really just works very, very nicely. So I'm all about creating content. And uh, you know, I taught high school English for a while, and I remember one of the things we did was create background music for stories and presentations that we had done. So one of my favorite tools is called UJAM. And I'll log in real fast over here with UJAM and show you, even if you're not doing anything with music, you're not a music teacher, you're, <laughs> you, maybe you don't even like music all that much in, in terms of uh, uh, thought about using it in your class. But what I want to show you over here is how easy it is to create, um, it, to create a piece of, of content, a piece of music to share with your students uh, that they could use in, in projects or in presentations or whatever it is that you might be doing. 
So I've gone to UJAM and I go to create a song, and I'm going to record song by vocals. Uh, so over here I'm going to hum a little tune for you right now. Uh, please <laughs> don't, don't – uh, my voice is bad enough. No, no comments in the, in the chat over here. So I'm going to press on record, and I'm going to go – all right, so we'll leave it there. I'll be here all week, uh, tipping waiters and waitresses. And what this is going to do is, um, let's see, uh, I go over here to convert this to an instrument. So my, my bum bums, my little humming was not so great, but I will tell you over here that you might be able to hear this a little bit nicer sounding than, than my little uh, babbling. So I did it pretty quick, but that was a grand piano that was playing over here. Um, very, very cool, very easy, but the, the thing I wanted to show you was just how fast it was. Um, this was in 15 seconds. You could have kids that don't know how to sing or don't want to sing clapping their hands, and then they can change that into different types of songs. So I can actually go over here and change this from the grand piano. I can go change this to a lead guitar. So we all wanted to hear a lead guitar version of, of Twinkle Twinkle, right? So here, here you go. And for those of you that are more interested in music, you can actually double tap onto the notes and then drag each note around to find a better place for it. So you can go over here to rare, good, best, uh, I love how it thinks my note was the best, but <laughs> clearly it doesn't have the musical ear that, that, uh, <laughs> that some other folks might. But you can basically change these notes and just drag and drop them, and it will change the way that the song sounds. So I'm not going to play it for you again, but, but you get the idea. This can be saved and shared as an MP3. It can be put down under a PowerPoint presentation. It can be done under, for an Animoto. For those of you that are doing video, it can be put into Wii Video. Um, lots of amazing stuff. And again, doesn't take long to make. So it's not a focus of the music. Uh, what I used to do is have students write a song that could be playing in the background of one of their scenes. Their job was to focus on the lyrics or the content of the song, but this is a great way to kind of get the melody or the song out very, very quickly. So hopefully that's, uh, that's new to some of you and a, and a pretty good, exciting one. Um, just as a, as a side note real fast, there's also a remixing feature over here. So you can actually take uh, other people's songs and remix them. So you kind of talked about Creative Commons before. I could, as a teacher, make a, a kind of a baseline track and have other students add multiple things to it so, and, and edit it, which is really very cool. Um, one of the other things, so, so we're coming up. It's now Connected Educator Month. Last year we had Hour of Code, which was really big. Um, last year, you know, getting millions of kids to learn how to write code. But code, you know, there's a lot of products out there. There's a lot of programs like Scratch, which I'm a big, big fan of, and um, there's some other ones as well. But one of the ones that I found recently that can kind of introduce students to how code works is something called Lightbot. And Lightbot is available as an app, but it's also this free little flash widget. And I'll show you very quickly. There's the basics over here. I'm going to click on one. And the goal is to get this guy to go over to the light. Okay? So you're going to use these commands to make him walk around. So for example, we're going to have him go forwards, forwards, and then turn on the light. And I'm going to click over here, and that worked. It shows you over here what the steps are. So it, it's a very, very cool tool to allow the students to kind of see the steps that will make him do something. So now it gets more complicated. Even, even on the second step, I have to go over here and figure out how to turn him. So I go forward once, turn once, forward, forward, turn, turn, forward, light. I don't know if that's right. I just did this fairly quickly. Nope, it's not. So that didn't work. But I can find out over here what's wrong and take away those steps and then figure out exactly um, where to go. So let's see if I do that. Um, very cool. So it's, again, just a really, really great way to get students um, getting, the, getting started with coding in, in a very fun way. And I, I'm a big fan of this as well. Uh, I'm kind of all over the place in terms of content because I want to make sure that we have something here that will fit you. I know that there's library media specialists with us. I know that there's other teachers from different subject areas. And if you're not getting these things for your classroom, if you're just gathering some good resources or new things for you, uh, hopefully running the gamut and jumping from, from content type to content type will kind of 
keep it fresh and interesting. So I, I for those of you that are very <laughs> you know single focused, uh, I'm sorry it jumps around a lot, but there's a lot of good tools in here that hopefully you can use. Uh, one of my all-time favorite tools, just because it is so teacher-focused and so simple, uh, is Remind, which is formerly Remind 101. Uh, I'm sure many people here have used Remind and have worked with it before. But if you haven't, I want to tell you what the basics are because I think it's really just an incredible, valuable tool. And I also want to share one or two new features with you as well. So I'll jump back to the presentation for this because I, I did some screenshots of their app. Um, but Remind you know, has been around for about three years, just an incredibly amazing tool. It, it allows you to kind of text the students and the parents in your classes without revealing your cell phone number. So that's kind of the basic premise. It started as like a one-way mass communication tool where I can kind of collect all the teachers' cell, uh, collect all the parents' cell phone numbers, text them with a message like bring in five dollars for the field trip, or make sure the project is, you know you study for the project or whatever it is. And um, you know now it has grown well beyond that to be even more useful for for many other things. So one of those things, you know, the basic tool is again sending out a message to a class, to a subset of the class. So if you're using scaffolded instruction, you have a group of students that you know always forgets to do the things that they're supposed to do, you can gently remind those students on their phone, which is of course a great benefit. You know, I used to send emails to kids and uh, you know, who checks their email anymore? It's so passe. Only us old folks check their email. Uh, kids are of course only going to be connected through their phones in many cases. And it works with, with regular phones, you know, quote unquote dumb phones, not just smartphones. Um, they make it really easy to get signed up, which I kind of appreciate both from the entrepreneurial side of things as well as from the user end side of things. It's super easy. So basically you text a code to a number and you're in. That makes it easier for parents. Uh, this summer, or just before the summer, they launched the ability to um, add attachments. So I can send uh, PDFs, or I could send documents, or pictures. If I'm taking pictures in my class or during a, a assembly, or whatever it is, I can send them pictures right through there. And um, <laughs> let's see, we call them Cellosauruses. I love it. That's awesome. Uh, yes, Cellosauruses. I will definitely steal that. And I'll give you credit. Don't worry, Christine. Thank you very much. Um, you could also schedule uh, things to go out later. So if you're a teacher, and I did this many times where on like Sunday I would try to do things to get the week in order. I wasn't necessarily going to remember to do a reminder on Wednesday. You can set that up in advance. Um, and the things that they've launched recently, I love the ability to, to through the app, use voice clips and also to attach um, these things called stamps, which are quick, you know, kind of, I guess they call them tests, but it really gives you like a, I get it, I don't get it, yes or no, or maybe. Um, and you can see the examples on the right-hand side where it's like, will you be able to attend back to school night? Quick, uh, yes or no. And you know, I just think that they're going in the right direction as a company. I just you know, can't say enough good things about them, but their apps are just very simple, very beautiful, very easy to use. And I just have a lot of respect for, for kind of what they're doing for communication. I think getting that parent-teacher communication, parent-student communication, and teacher-student communication, obviously, is so incredibly important. So give them a shot if you haven't already. It's definitely worth it, and it's a quick one to use. So since we talked about that, so uh, do my students have to share their numbers with the professor? My students don't want to share information with me. So they will not share their information with you. Their information will get added to, your, to the list over here. But you'll notice that if I click on the student, I don't get to see their number. So I'm looking at students that had signed up. I'm not going to have the ability to kind of text them or get their message to send them private messages. Um, it's completely anonymous that way, which is really, really cool. Um, meanwhile, the professor does not want us to text or call us. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, I feel like the times are really changing right now, and this is a way for, for us to keep those lines of communication open. It's a very, very safe and easy way to kind of break those barriers. And I, I think that, that this will be, you know, I, I, not the wave of the future. I think that this is currently the best way to reach kids. So highly recommend it. Um, getting away from my, my love for Remind, this is another old one, but I think a really important one. And if you're a library media specialist, I think this is one you must know. <laughs> there's, there's a few varieties out here. Print, print Friendly is one also. I happen to like Print You Like a little bit better just because of some of the feature sets. So what this does is allows me to type in a website over here like NewYorkTimes.com. 
And if you've seen children go in and, um, and basically look up a site and then print out everything that they find. So for example, if I printed out this New York Times page, you would see lots and lots of pages of images and you know, not basically the content that I want. So what this site allows me to do, you'll notice on the left-hand side, is the ability to, um, to check out a couple of these things as presets. So number one, I always like to talk about the fact that the New York Times is written in Times New Roman, which is a serif font. And it can be very, very hard for kids to read, especially kids that have low vision or have um, you know, reading disability. So you can go over here and make it Verdana. You know, make it something that's a little bit easier to read. And if they're low vision or if you're older and have vision issues yourself, you can make it larger. And better than that, if I wanted to come over here and I want just this article okay, about this CrossFit workout for a new demographic of preschoolers, I can command click on the items that I want and I can then go to isolate this. And that is a really cool feature. So I can take this and I can isolate those, those few things and then just print that out. So I'm going to go over here to isolate. It now pulled just those things out. I can click over here and delete any of the things I want. Oops. Actually quit out of that site. Sorry about that. Uh, and then, so let's say I go over here, I can actually go to um, remove all the images. So I can turn off all the background images. I can hide all of those things. Uh, hiding the margins makes it look insane, so don't turn those off. But uh, basically, I can isolate any of these pieces of content. I can remove it. I can, uh, let's say if I go to an image over here, I can actually widen it. That was a, uh, an ad, so the ads actually still are active. But this is a great way to kind of isolate the content and then um, be able to print just those few things for those students. So I can go over here and isolate it, and then I'll be able to print just this piece. So you just get the content you want. You can keep the byline, you can keep the, the titles and, the, and, the, uh, you know, and, and whatever content it is, but get rid of all of the junk. There is a bookmarklet for this as well. So really, really easy for, uh, for those of you that are used to putting bookmarklets in. You know, one caveat with that is that you, know, you will have to have the bookmarklet installed sometimes if you're not in control of the machines yourself. You'll have to get a technology person in the school to do it. Um, but they can easily put a bookmarklet tool that allows you to access this tool from any website. So you don't even have to go back to the site and do this. Um, so there you go. Are we citing what you print? Absolutely. So that's, that's the big piece over here is you can keep in uh, you know, keep in information like a byline. You could, of course, run it in <laughs> through EasyBib and throw on the byline there. But again, it's, it's really just a way to save uh, paper, so it's good for the environment, and save toner, so it's good for school budgets. Uh, low tech, but really, really good. I'm a, all about assessment, and I, I believe that all learners have to have an IEP. So not just students that have a disability or a learning difference, but I think that all of us have to have IEPs. Uh, you know, an individualized education plan where we could kind of set goals, self-assess, and then come back to those things later on. So one of the sites I love is futureme.org, which is a silly, simple site. I mean, you really just put in an email address to yourself, uh, your email. You can subject it, and you write an email, and then you set a date of delivery. And it sends it to you into the future. So what I love about this is that it allows you to kind of set goals. I've done this with students. It works with a a uh, really, really simple, really, really simple way to kind of just set a self-assessment. You could do it for a week. You could do it for a semester. I've even had students that have started to do this the first day of high school, and they set it towards their graduation date four years in the future. So just an amazing way to kind of keep track of either personal goals or professional goals, or even just you know, as, a, as a running diary type of thing. And, and it's so easy and simple. This is the entire site. And uh, they're actually working on a student based version of this where I believe that there will be teacher logins and other things like that. But love, love this, this use. Um, so someone said they saw a first grade class use this. Yeah, I mean this, this is one of those tools that just as long as you can type decently or, or you know, dictate to someone that can type it in, just a great tool to use in classes. I, I love the idea of checking in and doing this type of self-assessment. So just jumping into uh, <laughs> some other stuff. So we're going to go back into the artsy stuff. This is something that I was working on with a teacher recently. I worked with a school district and they asked me for creative ways to kind of inspire students. So one of the things I did with this class of kids was we created um, a, a, one of these masterpieces, which is through a site called Recite This. And a lot of you that might use uh, Pinterest or other sites like that, 
uh, may have seen these types of pretty images on the bottom. They're basically these gorgeous pictures. I'll use this one over here. Let's see. That looks like New York, so we'll, we'll go with that one. And you can put in any quote you want to be. Uh, be, uh, let's see, to be or not to be. That is a question. <laughs> and you, of course, can cite your source. Someone old said that. And I can come over here and look at all of these on the bottom. You'll see all of these different beautiful posters. You can make it look like an iPhone conversation. You can make it look like it's written on a cardboard box. You can make it look like it's in the woods. And then all you have to do is go to click on that piece of content, and you automatically get this printed out. You can print it. You can put it on Facebook, Tumblr, all these different social places, or download the image. And what I did with those students was we downloaded these images, we laminated them, and we let a um, – we let a half of the page, so we put it on an 8.5 by 11 page with half of the page left blank, laminated it, and put it onto our desks in the upper left-hand corner. So now the students all had a small whiteboard with an inspirational quote on it. And it was one of those really cool uh, things we did this summer, and the classroom was, was just awesome. Like all the kids got to do their own quotes, and we all had these little whiteboards, and it was very, very cool. Um, so your school doesn't let you download it. Yeah, that's, that's sometimes a problem. You can definitely email it to yourself and then print it out later, or you can choose to just print it out there. Or, of course, if you really wanted to, you can post it somewhere and then pull it down later. And it's always hard when schools kind of put up these roadblocks to impede what's going on to help the learning. But that's a whole different conversation for a, another webinar, uh, ways around school filters and whatnot. Um, Emily, I believe, are we going a full hour, or is it just another few minutes, and then you guys want to jump in and do some, some talk about easy bids? Hey, Adam. Um, no, the hour is all yours. We don't do uh, any product plugs here, so you can keep going. We usually like to leave maybe five or ten minutes at the end for questions, um, but keep doing what you're doing. We've still got time. Okay, cool. So I'll definitely leave about ten minutes for, for questions. Um, <laughs> I will hunt you down if you leave early. <laughs> Naomi, that's, <laughs> you know, a little scary to me, but okay. <laughs> I'll keep going. I'll talk faster. I'm sorry. Uh, so one of the tools I really came to, to really love this year is actually created by a friend of mine. So this is created by uh, Carlos Fernandez, who if you don't know him, he's an educator in Florida. I believe now he works for Microsoft. But he also has created a bunch of tools for educators. And this is one that he created. It is completely free, so I'm not you know, trying to pitch someone else's stuff. But um, this is a tool he created, and it was because he felt that educators needed a better back channel than what we've been using. So some people have been using a back channel. Today's Meet is extremely popular just because of its ease of use. Um, real fast, a back channel is a way for students and teachers and well, really anyone, all participants, to be part of a conversation in real time. So it's like a less overwhelming version of Twitter. So you know. You can get 20 students on here at a time, or you can get many, many more students on here. Create what they call a room. So I'll show you over here. I'm going to create a room called, let's see, Easy Bib. In the room, I could set an expiration for a day. Uh, let's see, a week, month. Let's do uh, a week. And I'm going to create this room. I now can come over here. As a student, if you signed up, I can actually go and get this room information. So here is the address. So if you join 81-.com slash easybib, you can enter the room as well. And then I can type in messages. So I can say, hi there. So much like the chat that we have going on right now, you could join this small room. It's a little bit more private than before. And I will also be able to have control over some of the things that go on here. For example, I can create a task list for you. So here's the five objectives we have for today's conversation. I can send files, so I can select a file over here, and uh, let me find something that's small. I could take this file and I could send it. And uh, we also can do things like get a transcript of all of the things that were said in here. And if someone posted something I didn't like, or you know, was it being slightly inappropriate, I can come over here and delete that. However, it would not get deleted from the transcript. So there's a running record of everything that's been talked about. I could see who's in the room. I could lock the room so no one else can get the codes. I can do a whole bunch of stuff over here. And um, I, I happen to really love this. You also can do things like uh, the at reply symbol. So if you're, doing, if you're used to Twitter and you can kind of at uh, mention someone, you would be able to just get your mentions on the bottom over here. So Steve Dambo told me I was looking handsome. Uh, he needs to get his vision checked. But uh, 
this is this is a great great tool, and and again one that's very simple works on iPads, works on on other tablets and other machines, and um, yeah, Heidi, I, I definitely recommend it as well. I think it's a great way. One of the one of the ways that I love to use uh, you know these types of tools, and especially this one, is using a back channel when you're doing a presentation. So whether it be you doing a lecture or doing like a presentation for your peers or for for colleagues. It's a great way for people that don't want to raise their hand and ask questions. The same way it's going on in the chat right now through Meeting Burner, it's the same idea where they can kind of everyone can participate. There's no feeling like you're interrupting anybody. And on top of that, um, you know Richard Byrne, who's a good friend of mine who runs Free Technology for Teachers, great website to learn new tools. He talks about uh, when he was a social studies teacher, he used um, a back channel program in his school in his classroom, and he felt that he was able to show a lot more videos and and have pointed conversations where everyone can weigh in. So let's say he wanted to show an hour-long documentary from TV that was amazing. He can do that and then put questions that were preloaded in the chat and then converse with the students back and forth through the back channel and see who is participating and have them work on it. So um, really just like you know, the, the idea of getting all students involved. So I have a couple more minutes, so I'm going to uh, show you one called A Web Whiteboard. And a web whiteboard, a w w app, is a very very simple tool that works on all modern browsers. So if you're using anything over Internet Explorer 8, so I think 9, 10, uh, Chrome, Safari, Firefox, all those good things, and this works on those. And it also works in on um, mobile mobile devices as well. So it'll work on your iPhone or your Android, etc. And what it does is allows you to join and do uh, whiteboards uh, over here with a group of people. So I can, of course, project what I'm writing. So I'm going to say, you know, one plus one equals. I can change my colors. I can change. I can have some text. Um, very simple over here, which I really like. I like the fact that this is kind of uh, a very, very easy to use tool where there's not too many options. There's not 5,000 colors or unlimited numbers of thicknesses. So you can kind of come over here, and I can go over it to post this. I'm actually wondering why I don't have one of my options over here. Let's see. Oh, hold on one second. Let me refresh this and see what I got going on. Ah, there it is. Invite. <laughs> I was wondering, I'm like, where did it go? So I can actually take this URL and invite you all to uh, to do this. So if I wanted to, I can take this. I could bring it into something like a Bitly um, and shorten the URL. So here's the URL. It's one uh, v y four j s v. Um, let's see if I can put that in the chat real fast. Uh, ba -bum, ba -bum. Actually, if someone else wants to do that. That'd be just amazing. One uh, v y four capital J s capital V. And if not, that's totally cool because I think you guys will will kind of see what we're going to be able to do with it anyway. Um, but you'll be able to kind of come in and use this. Could it be used in 81 Dash? Yes. So you can use this. You just put a link in there, and you could just link them out to anywhere. Thank you so much. So Russell, you win the prize. Uh, I don't know. A prize yet to be determined, but there you go. So I'm going to come over here again, and I'm going to do one plus one, and I'm going to ask someone to grab a blue pen and put the answer in over here. And you know, again, this is just a really quick and easy way to collaborate using these boards. It's great for – thank you very much. <laughs> I don't know if this is a KWL chart, so I can come over here. And th yeah, this is when the fun starts. You have to kind of teach the teachers not to go crazy with it. Um, but basically over here, we can do a KWL chart. We can do uh, very, very simple tools. I can actually come over here and clear this. So sorry for all of you that are working on a masterpiece. But um, we can do a lot of different things collaboratively here. It's great for drawing manipulatives. So if I wanted to draw things like, you know, do math assignments, oh, or or pretty, you know, like Zorro type drawings, <laughs> I could do that here too. Um, we have another four minutes, so I, I don't want to talk about. Let's see, I did the noun project. I'm not going to talk too much about Edge Clipper. Talked about Future Me. So we'll end with one that's a little bit nerdy, but one that I really love. Um, so this one is. If this, then that. And if this, then that is a way to kind of create if-then statements for nerds uh, to, to make life easy. This is a way to get technology to work for you. So for example, 
I'm a huge fan, huge fan of taking content and um, – you know, using things like Instagram in the classroom. I think Instagram is a, is a great, you know, tool for taking selfies and taking pictures of my food. But I love the idea of teachers using it to capture what's going on in the classroom and easily share it privately with a subset of parents. And you might be saying, well, how do you share it privately on, on Instagram? You can have a private account on Instagram and use a hashtag. So if I hashtag it, you know, um, classroom 102. And I could set up an if-then statement over here. I'm going to go to create a recipe. And I'm going to go click this. So I'm going to click this. This is the trigger. So if this, I'm going to go to Instagram. If on Instagram, I create a new photo that has been tagged with the tag um, classroom 101, then what happens? I go to that, and it tells me what happens. I want to go over here to Email Digest. And that Email Digest is going to be added to a weekly digest that gets delivered at 2 o'clock on Friday, and you could message, you know, who is it going to get delivered to, what's the captions, all that stuff. So the caption is the title. And the beauty of this is I now have all the pictures I've taken in my classroom can be sent to a uh, uh, digest at the end of the week that I could forward to all my parents. So a great, simple way to kind of communicate with them very, very easily in a way that you would do so normally through social media. Um, there are other recipes that I think as teachers you'll find incredibly useful, especially depending on where in the country you live. Uh, I'll show you some of my recipes that I use. These are, these are things I actually use. So for example, if I check into some place on Foursquare, it goes to a Google spreadsheet. Um, then super duper nerdy, so the spreadsheet gets converted into a place on a Google map. Um, I, I kind of get to see exactly where I was, and if I go to Google Maps, it will show me all those places. That's not necessarily good for everybody. But uh, the other thing I have over here, if I take a picture on Instagram, it goes to my Dropbox folder. So for those of you that are afraid, like, oh, what if one of these sites goes away or if they start charging, whatever, it automatically would download all of your pictures into a special place. So it could be Drive, it could be Dropbox, it could be your computer, it could be whatever you want it to be. I also love this one. If the weather is going to be, whatever the weather is going to be, I want a text. So every morning at 7 o'clock, uh, I get a text telling me what the weather. It's been triggered 478 times, so I've been using this for a while. Um, but I also get if it's going to be snowing tomorrow it sends me an alert of the forecast the day before. This is great for principals that need to know when they can uh, you know, talk to the school about closing down. And it's also great for you if you're like, oh, I need to get gas, I need to do this, I need to do whatever. So it's great for, for things that are, are you know, not necessarily completely school-related, but it's also wonderful to communicate with parents. Uh, Tumblr is a great site for students uh, to be using with, the, with their teacher or, or for the parents. So we could do the same recipe for putting those, those Instagram pictures on a specific Tumblr page. Um, lots of really, really great things. And, and the recipes here are endless. So you, know, you can come in here and notice there are a million different things that you can, uh, you, know, you can use with this site. So if you're saying, well, this doesn't necessarily apply to me, take a look at it because it's pretty amazing to, uh, you know, to, to see how to do this. So I'm looking at, uh, let's see, I'm just trying to go back to the chat. I guess this is a good time um, to kind of start taking some questions. We have about 10 minutes left. Happy to go in-depth on anything that you might want to know more about, um, whether it be something I've showed or if you just want to know something about something else. And of course, you know, Emily, if there's any questions that you've been fielding, uh, feel free to let me go. So I would try and check the chat, but I haven't, uh, <laughs> I haven't looked up too much. So questions? Adam, you've been, uh, you've been tackling most of the questions that I was, uh, that I was making note of. So, um, so oh, good, good work okay. with that. And um, I must say this has been a, this has been a really fantastic webinar. I mean, these resources are great for teachers, but I'm seeing lots of ways that we can even use this on our end here at EasyBib. And I know my colleague Jenny, who's live tweeting, she has been super enthusiastic about it too. So um, thank you so much. And yeah, if anyone has any questions, uh, comments, anything like that, feel free to drop them in the chat box now. We have a few minutes. Um, and Adam's here to address anything that you guys need. So I'm seeing some love for if this and that. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, I, I must say I'm a bit of a newbie, and I had never heard of that. But it seems like a lot of our participants uh, are big on it so far. Yeah, that's great. And thanks, Judy. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll tell you, while you guys are coming in, and if you have questions about stuff, I'd love to answer anything that I can. Um, 
I will say, you know, I always want to stress, like, it's great to hear about these new tools, and hopefully your brain's kind of firing off ways that you could use it in your classroom. Um, but it really isn't about the tools. It's, it's about you. It's about what you do with these tools in the classroom, what you allow the students to do. And, um, you know, I, I think that there's a lot of great stuff there. So I do see a question, are the tools Mac and PC compatible? The beautiful thing, Lori, is that these are all web tools. So there's nothing that I've been doing on the computer that is related to a piece of hardware other than something connected to the Internet. Um, iPad will have trouble with some things that are Flash, so Lightbot, which was the programming little game, that won't work on, uh, on iPads or iPhones. Neither will the My Storybook Maker, but it will work on – all the other tools work on every other uh, piece of, of hardware you have, which is really nice. Um, I see a question from Christine. How do I keep up with all these tools <laughs> and uh, what they do? So, uh, well, I mean, that's, that's a, a good segue. So there's, there's two things that I do. First of all, the first site that I ever created was called Edutecker, uh, which sometimes gets called Edutecher. But Edutecker is – a, basically a search engine for web tools. So it's a very, very easy way for me to have shared different tools. How I keep up with them is I, I use Twitter. I use all sorts of other technologies um, to, to learn about all these tools. So for example, over here, if I want to come in, this is how you use my older site, which allows you to kind of go through and find all these amazing tools. There's, I think, almost 2,000 tools that have been cataloged on here so far. But I read people's blogs. I mean, I learn from, from my friend Richard Byrne. I read, Kathy Schrock, who has a guide to everything, literally, uh, Larry Ferlazzo, Stephen Anderson, Kyle Pace. You know, there are so many amazing educators out there that have just dedicated their lives to not only doing their jobs, but sharing and, and you know, putting out great resources. So, you know, I've done the same here in this vein, but on Twitter, there's a, just a, a wealth of resources. Checking EdTechChat or EdChat, well, you'll find amazing numbers of resources. Um, can I send you a list of those bloggers? I, I definitely can try. I'll wrangle them up. I mean, my list of bloggers. If you, actually, you know what? If you go to my name on Twitter and see who I'm following, that's who I learn from. That's a really good way for me to kind of tell you, like, those are the folks I'm learning from. There's a lot of people there, but, um, you know, those are the folks that I find to share some really valuable information. Um, Digo, Symbaloo, all of these sites are great. One of the other sites that, that you know, I use to organize this whole, uh, my content for you, is EduClipper, which is the site that I created. And it allows you to kind of come in here. If I found a great web tool, for example, let's say it was EasyBib, I can come over here, type in EasyBib, go to Submit, and it brings in um, the EasyBib site that I can automatically share. This is kind of, sometimes people refer to this as like the Pinterest of education. It does a lot more than that. It allows you to create digital portfolios and allows you to do assignments and give feedback and all sorts of other cool stuff. But a lot of people have used this to, to kind of catalog and share sites. So that's a good one. Um, Drago is good. There's, there's tons of them, which is really nice. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of these. And I will also – must have missed the URL. So, oh, so the URL is uh, it's bit.ly, B-I-T dot O-Y. Let me just go back and show that last part. Uh, slash Web Tools 2014. And I believe the W and the T in Web Tools are capitalized. So I'll just put that up on the screen so you can see that nice and big. Hey, Adam, uh, we did have one question come in from the Q&A uh, from Susan that I just wanted to run by you because I sure. don't think you have uh, access to that. She said um, this is related to the If This Then That app that you were talking about. Um, she said, I'm trying an Instagram scavenger hunt this year, and I'm running into problems because the students' accounts are set to private. Do you know if there's a way to write a recipe um, that can sort of circumvent this, this issue? Or if they're set to private, is that – kind of like the end of it, you know? No, I believe case? it. I believe it. Yeah, I mean, I believe if they're set to private, they're set to private. Um, the students should be able to, if they, if they, yeah, you know, unfortunately, that, that won't get around it. Um, private it's kind of like when your Twitter <laughs> profile is, is set to private and then you can't view anyone's tweets either. I think it kind of works in the same capacity. It, exactly, exactly. You won't be able to broadcast even if it's something you want to be public. You kind of, you, you choose one or the other. Right, right. Got it. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, if anyone else has any other questions, um, lots of uh, positive feedback here. Um, so Adam, thank you so much. And people uh, who are participating today, you have all been making lots of great suggestions. So what we're going to do, uh, we get an archived copy of the chat. 
so what we'll do is we will put that into a spreadsheet, and we'll uh, make all of your names anonymous, but we will make sure that all of the great resources that you've been sharing will be accessible, and we'll include that in the follow-up email as well. So you'll have the webinar recording, um, Adam's slides from his presentation, and then we'll include uh, the chat log as well. Awesome. And thank you. I see everyone saying thank you. So Donna, hi, and <laughs> thank you, Katie, <laughs> Kathy, everyone. So no, it's my pleasure to share with you. And obviously, you know, there's a lot of tools out there. Feel free to connect with me on Twitter if you have any questions or just want to you know, learn some more stuff. Feel free to connect. I'm, I'm pretty accessible. So, and, and to all the easy to folks, especially Emily and everyone else there, uh, you know, always a pleasure to kind of work with you guys. You have such a great product and offer so much both from the product side as well as doing all this PD and, and sharing. So thank you for having me as part of it. Thank you, Adam. It's been a real pleasure uh, working with you, and I hope that you know, we can find another way to collaborate again in the future for sure. Absolutely. Awesome. Thanks guys so much. Um, I saw one person ask when the next session is. Um, I believe it's going to be in a couple of weeks. Uh, we usually have two uh, PD sessions per month, but this month we actually have three. Um, so we will include the information for that in the follow-up email as well. Um, so Adam, th once again, thank you, and thank you to everyone who took time out of your busy schedules to join us today. And uh, keep an eye out for the follow-up email in your inbox in the next couple of days. And uh, hope to see you all again at an EasyBib PD webinar soon. All right, that was fun. Thanks, Adam. Have a good one. You too. Bye-bye.